Back in the bad old days of 2021, when coins like Ethereum, Doge and FTX token were booming, 8GB cards like the RX 580 vanished from shelves as they were rounded up and carted away to the crypto mines. Once the shit coins started crashing again, former miners took to eBay and AliExpress to try and recoup some of their lost earnings by flogging off Polaris at rock bottom prices. In a time where 8GB cards look increasingly desirable to gamers and the new market still lacks a solid entry level offering, is the RX 580 still worth considering or should we leave the miners holding the bag? In years past, the RX 480 and 580 have generally been high on my list of recommendations for budget gaming GPUs. Even during the scalper pandemic, when 8GB cards were particularly prized by crypto miners, the 4GB cards were still among the most reasonably priced and decently performing cards available. This year, above others, the amount of VRAM is becoming a major sticking point. We're seeing a rash of poorly optimised console ports and cross-platform games originally built for machines with 10 gigabytes or more VRAM, and 4 and even 6 gig cards are not handling these titles well. Despite the fact that the RX 580 is now closer to the minimum spec than the recommended for today's AAA games, does the 8 gigabyte model retain any relevance in gaming? To find out, I'm testing this dual fan model from ASUS. This is a genuine RX 580 with 2304 shader units, and that's an important distinction. Lately there have been some shady practices around this family of cards that you should be wary of when shopping. There's a fringe industry of sellers remanufacturing their own cards, using old silicon from dead X mining units, and there are allegations that other unscrupulous sellers are reflashing BIOSes on working RX 570s and 580s to make them appear to be the next model up in the range. This isn't helped at all when AMD themselves have an official spec for an RX 580 2048 that is, in effect, just an overclocked RX 570, and a 590 GME that's just a 580 with a different BIOS. I'm not saying these other cards are without merit, okay I might be saying that, but make sure you're paying an appropriately lower price for anything with fewer than 2304 shader units, as you can expect a good 5-10% to less performance. Anyway, with that dire warning out of the way, the test PC specs are on screen now, and without further scaremongering, here are the bench... Starting with the tough one, The Last of Us is the kind of game that isn't going to run at all well on a 4GB card of any flavour, owing to its extremely high VRAM demands, but 8GB should be sufficient for playing at 1080p medium, if the GPU can keep up. Well, if you can tolerate a 30fps experience, the RX 580 can just about keep pace, averaging 35 and with lows only slightly under the 30 mark. In fact, the extra VRAM meant that I was able to tweak a couple of the more memory intensive settings up to high. The 8GB RX 580 is actually the minimum recommended GPU for Jedi Survivor, though it's not clear exactly what you should expect. Well, like The Last of Us, you may have to adjust your expectations down a bit. 1080 medium stays mostly above the 30fps mark and averages 36, all while looking… okay, I guess. I appreciate not everyone wants to lean on upscaling tech, and you certainly don't need to use FSR if you don't want to, but for those who don't mind the temporal artefacts, you can actually run the game at 1080 epic at roughly the same frame rate as medium just by adding FSR quality. It might come as some surprise that the Resident Evil 4 Remake isn't even in the same category as the previous two games. It's easy enough to hit 60fps without taking a sledgehammer to image quality. At 1080 balanced with textures at 3GB, the FPS averages almost 64 and only drops into the low 50s, all without upscaling or interlacing. Though, of course, if you prefer a locked 60, those options are open to you. Personally, I'm in favour of a little more fidelity and at max quality, which of course in this case doesn't enable ray tracing, as the 580 doesn't support it, the average drops to 45 and lows to 35. 
This generation of GPU can develop a minor glitch in Forza Horizon 5, whereby any 2D elements with alpha transparency channels will see that channel turn solid black. You'll see it on license plates and decals, and the solution is to turn on temporal anti-aliasing, or TAA. This has a bit of a negative effect on FPS, though thankfully not enough to make the 580 unviable. 1080 Medium can maintain a lot 60 experience, averaging 75 FPS. Turning quality up to the high preset cuts averages down to 67, but can see the minimums drop below the 60 mark, and the ultra preset sees averages in the mid to high 40s. Sufficient for a locked 30 FPS, though personally I might be inclined to add some FSR at this point. Although I haven't really mentioned it yet, I'm actually keeping tabs on how the 580 is doing compared to its old rival, the GTX 1066GB which I tested the other week. So far, it had been doing pretty well. 10% faster in The Last of Us, 20% in Jedi, but Halo Infinite's gonna let me down here. Not that I'm surprised, the 4GB RX 480 was pretty disappointing when I tested it last year, and I didn't feel like extra RAM was what the game was crying out for. Still, at 1080 low, things are pretty painful in both big team battles and smaller team slayer matches, averaging in the low to high 40s depending on the map. If you're looking to play Halo with the 580, you might want to consider using dynamic resolution scaling. A Plague Tale Requiem is a game that deserves to be played without too much in the way of visual compromises, and I for one am usually happy to play at less than 60 FPS. If you feel the same way, then the RX 580 can do a reasonable job. At the medium preset, the VRAM isn't being overly stressed, and you could probably push some settings a little further, but this is a demanding game, and at 1080 with the Ultra Resolution Optimizer, you'll only reach a 38 FPS average and sub 30 FPS 1% lows, so I'm afraid there's not much to be gained from going above medium. Dropping resolution optimizer to performance can push the average up to 60 if you're less able to stomach lower frame rates, though things do get a bit soft. Stepping back to some less demanding games, and God of War is a pretty good time here. At 1080 original, averages are about 62 FPS, and lows drop into the 50s, though in more intensive cutscenes I'd expect to see them drop even further than that. Of course, the original preset doesn't touch the sides of the 8GB frame buffer, so turning up texture quality to ultra helps make you feel justified in your purchase without sacrificing more than a frame or two. As usual, it's a similar story in Spider-Man Remastered, though with significantly worse 1% lows and substantial drops when viewing the city from above. In fact, this is all possible at 1080 high, though not quite at very high. I found I needed to enable FSR quality to maintain a 60 plus average. In fact, it goes all the way up to uh, 69. Uncharted 4 isn't a dramatically different scene either. At 1080 medium, the game reaches a 63 FPS average with 54 FPS 1% lows, and of course this isn't really utilising the 8GB VRAM as much as you might like. Turning up to Ultra would certainly do that, but it would also nix any chances of a 60 FPS experience. FSR quality actually makes for a great experience here, maintaining that 60 plus average without harming minimums much. I have to apologise to anyone watching this after September 2023. Cyberpunk 2077 hasn't received the Phantom Liberty update at the time of recording, so I don't yet know how the RX 580 is going to handle it. If I still have the card by the time the DLC drops, I'll probably do another video to see how it compares. Anyway, as is, Cyberpunk needs some compromises to even get close to 60, requiring the medium preset as well as at least balanced FSR, maybe even performance for a genuinely smooth time. However, if you're happy with a solid and sturdy 30, you can skip FSR altogether and see averages of 40 and minimums of 32. 
You can even turn up to high, thanks in part to the 8GB frame buffer, and averages see a drop to just 35 FPS. The Witcher 3 gave me a bit of an unpleasant surprise. At 1080 high with TAA enabled, the frame rate was fine, over 60 on average, only dropping into the mid 50s. High enough that an older CPU might actually hold you back in some parts of the game. The unpleasantness was the random black blobs on the ground, looking like Miles Morales' nemesis had run rampant through Novigrad. Turning up to Ultra resolves this, but cuts the average frame rate by a whopping 10 FPS. I don't know if this is something that might be fixed with a driver update, or maybe fiddling around with settings somewhat, but still, weird to see. Fortnite at 1080p is well within the RX 580's wheelhouse, though you probably won't see the advantages of the bigger frame buffer this time. At low settings, with 100% res scaling at epic view distance, the game runs at over 130 FPS, well into the territory of potential CPU bottlenecks for owners of older or budget systems. The medium preset, again at 100% scaling, sees barely any drop in perceptible performance, at least to a noob like me. The average is still above 100 FPS, and the game does look pretty damn good. At high though, the fancy new UE5 features are a bit too much for this Polaris card to handle, with averages down in the 40s making for a pretty rough time. Warzone 2 is a real show-off title for AMD GPUs right now. Although at 1080 basic it isn't exactly a feast for the eyes, its 87 FPS average is 20% faster than a GTX 1650 and 70% faster than a 6GB 1060, and makes this an excellent choice for COD players on a tight budget. Although I don't have any of the lower end RDNA 1 or 2 cards to hand right now to compare, I think the RX 580 2304 SP version acquits itself quite nicely in modern games, especially given the price. One area where you might be somewhat dubious though is power consumption. As you've probably noticed, this particular model isn't heavily overclocked, and yet still consumes about 145 watts while gaming, about 60 watts more than the still current RX 6500 XT. Now, I don't really recommend that card to uh, anyone, but in the current situation I can understand why people might be wary of pushing up their electricity bills further than necessary. To that end, I spent a little time undervolting the RX 580 with some pretty decent results. I didn't run the gamut of tests, but with a minus 130mV adjustment to the curve in afterburner, I was able to bring power consumption way down, peaking at 115 watts and averaging closer to 105 without dropping from the 1360MHz clock speed. Both Spider-Man and The Last of Us saw basically identical benchmark results, which is a pretty good result for a 6-year-old GPU. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see me do a deeper dive on undervolting older components. The RX 580 is a tough one to wholeheartedly recommend. In the current market it can be had for £75 or less, and in 2023 it's hard to think of a better buy. However, any GPUs for sale today are virtually guaranteed to be ex-mining cards, and many of the examples, even those from reputable brands and even those that claim to be brand new, actually use cut-down silicon, and therefore won't perform quite as well as you've seen in this video. The risk of buying X mining cards can be mitigated somewhat by buying from reputable sources, especially if you can purchase using a credit card or PayPal in order to give yourself some added peace of mind. To avoid the lesser spec cards, you may need to be a little more diligent about who you buy from, read the fine print, look out for the number 2048 anywhere in the specs, and just assume that any brand new cards from unknown brands are probably scams. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.